كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this new episode of The Role Model sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Speech is a gift from Allah azza wa jal and Allah favored us over other creations of His with this blessing and the way a person talks is indicative of his intellect. Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with him, said that a person's tongue is a piece of his mind, which means that when you speak, this is an indication of your caliber and what a person you are. Jabir ibn Samura, may Allah be pleased with him, used to describe the Prophet والسلام, as a person who would prolong his silence and laugh a little. And this is a sign of wisdom, of dignity, that you don't spill your guts all over the place. Rather, you maintain your honor, you don't talk without any legitimate reason and when you do, you don't take the whole hour or the whole event spending it on talking just for people to look at you and to listen to you. Without any doubt, the Prophet ﷺ was the most articulate person to have ever uh, uh, speak in the language of the Arabs or any other language. He said about himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, I was given the concise of speech, meaning that it's a gift from Allah azza wa jal, to speak few words and it these words contain so much information and value that you may need volumes to write them down in. For example, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ One of the most known hadiths to everyone. Verily, deeds are judged by intentions. There is no form of worship that this hadith is not involved in. And every single book that Muslims have written include this hadith. Also the, beaut <coughs> the beautiful phrase, the beautiful sentence, the legal maxim, la darara wa la dirar. Neither causing harm nor reciprocating harm. Don't do this. This is a law. In two words, la darara wa la dirar. And you can cascade this to all aspects of life. Also, the beautiful legal statement that all jurors and judges and those dealing with the law know. And this is one of the most needed laws to be implemented. Al bayyinatu ala man idda'a wal yameenu ala man ankar. Someone comes and accuses me of taking his money, of raping his sister, of a shameful act. Anyone could accuse me of doing this. Should we listen to him? The Prophet said, no, alayhi salatu wasalam. He has to provide the evidence to prove his allegation. al bayyinatu ala man Any one woman coming and pretending that or claiming that someone raped her. Should we hang him? Of course not. She might be a big liar. 
give us the proof that can stand in a court of law, not just allegations and tears and the likes. If that person claiming is false or is unable to bring evidence to back his claim, the Prophet says, ankar." Then the accused must swear by Allah that he did not do this. End of story. 95% of people's allegations and cases are solved through this magnificent phrase. He was given the concise of speech. And the Prophet as described by Mother Aisha, when he spoke, he didn't speak like 60 miles per hour. He wasn't fast and just throwing words right, left, left and center. Rather, he used to speak in a very eloquent and articulate fashion that everyone understands every single letter that he is saying. And she says that if a person wanted to count the number of words that come out of the Prophet's mouth, alayhi salatu wasalam, they could have done that. Anas bin Malik says, when the Prophet spoke, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes, when needed, he would repeat what he had said three times so that people would comprehend it. And this is a form of drawing people's attention and ensuring that what was said is not to be neglected. Once he came and saw his companions performing wudu and they were very tired after a very long journey. And he noticed that some of them due to being to so tired, they were not washing their feet and heels properly. So only the top of the foot. So he said three times, وَيْلٌ لِلْأَعْقَابِ مِنَ النَّارِ Woe to these heels from hellfire. And he repeated it thrice. And you can guess what impact this left upon those who were making wudu. Also, the Prophet ﷺ would give salam three times when wanting to enter a house. And this is like ringing the bell. So we'd say, Assalamu alaikum, adkhul, no response. Assalamu alaikum, adkhul, shall I come in? No response. Assalamu alaikum, adkhul, if there is no response, he would go and leave. And also the Prophet once was sitting with his companions in the well-known hadith to all of you. And he said, shall I not tell you about the biggest of all major sins? And he repeated this question three times. So you can imagine the audience's attention to what was coming afterwards. And the Prophet Sallallahu rhetoric was straight to the heart because he used to select and choose the best of words. Dhimad ibn Thalaba, when the Prophet was in Mecca alayhi salatu wasalam, heard of a man and he's, they told him that he's crazy, he's insane. And Dhamad was someone who did ruqya and did exorcism. He dealt with taking the jinn out of the people. Though he was not a Muslim, but he had this ability in him. So he went to the Prophet and said, listen, I know how to cure insane people. So would you like me to help you? The Prophet ﷺ did not say to him, what do you think? You think I'm crazy? I'm mad? Get out of my face. No. The Prophet replied to him with these beautiful words. إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ لِلَّهِ نَحْمَدُهُ وَنَسْتَعِينُهُ مَنْ يَهْدِهِ اللَّهُ فَلَا مُضِلَّ لَهُ وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمَّا بَعْدُ 
The man said, whoa, hold your horses down. Repeat this. And the Prophet ﷺ repeated it three times. Then the guy said, listen, I've traveled the world. I heard soothsayers' wordings, fortune tellers, those possessed by jinn. I've heard the poets. I've heard orators. I've never heard anything similar to what comes out of your mouth. And this is the most optimum of all rhetorics. And the man accepted Islam on the spot. Beautiful words that come out of his mouth. And the Prophet ﷺ was also, in a, in a way, as we use this terminology, diplomatic. In the sense that whenever he wanted to say something that might be repulsive to some, he would pave the way. Because it has, has to be said. So in a hadith, once the Prophet addressed the companions, he said, listen, I am to you as a father to his children. So I teach you. When you defecate, do not face the qibla or you give your backs to it. And he orders of three stones to cleanse yourself with, which is like toilet tissues and three wipes minimum. And he forbade them from using dung or bones in cleaning themselves. And he prohibited a person to clean himself using his right hand. So the Prophet gave an introduction to his teachings with these beautiful words, I am like a father to his children. Sometimes when he spoke, he used to swear by Allah Azza wa Jal, to put emphasis on what he says. Though everybody believes him, but this is needed to draw your attention and to give importance to what you're about to say. And he usually used the word or the phrase, وَالَّذِي nafsi بِيَدِهِ By whom my soul is in his hands. In other incidents, the Prophet ﷺ would pause a question so that he would draw their attention. Like in the well-known hadith, أَتَدْرُونَ مَنِ الْمُفْلِسِ Do you know who is a person who's broke? And they said, the one who doesn't have money. Then the, he clarified it to them, said, no. He's a person that comes on the Day of Judgment with lots of prayers, fasting, charity, but he slandered this man, hit that man, backbit this one, shed the blood of that one, took the money of this one. So he comes on the Day of Judgment and he gives each one he had wrong done from his good deeds. And if his good deeds are over before giving back what he owes to people, then they give him from their bad deeds and then he would be thrown into hell. This is someone who's truly broke. So, was the Prophet والسلام, a person who's described as loud? So that we know people when they speak in gatherings, they're so loud, they're so dominant, you can't hear anything except what they say. <clears throat> Was he like this? Well, Al-Miqdad, may Allah be pleased with him, says, whenever the Prophet ﷺ entered a gathering or a room or a hall, he would give, he would give the salam to a level that someone who's awake can hear but someone who's asleep would not be awakened by. So the Prophet's tone was very moderate and very delicate. <clears throat> he would not enter like 
every time we're in the masjid, especially in Ramadan, before prayer time or during uh, uh, between Adhan and Iqama, people come into the masjid, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Why are you shouting? Why are you giving salam as if you're the imam for everybody? And this is not a single person. You get like 50, 70 people coming in, everybody's shouting his head off. This is not from the sunnah. Yes, if you come and pray to rak'ahs and there's someone you know, you privately say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, shake hands. No problem in that. But the Prophet, when he entered the room, he would say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So those who awake can hear, but those who are asleep would not be bothered by his salam. And when it was needed, he would raise his voice. As in the case of Friday khutbah. He's giving a speech. He's addressing thousands of people. It's not logical to speak about hell and heaven and about warning people of the day of judgment from the day of judgment by saying, and you have to fear the day of judgment. And hellfire is frightening. It is so hot. It is so uh, intimidating. People will fall asleep. No. The Prophet Sallallahu whenever he gave a khutbah, he would raise his voice and his uh, uh, cheeks would uh, grow and his veins would appear as if he's warning the people, there's a, an army coming to attack you. Just now, how would a person warning people from an army coming to attack them? He would definitely shout at them and this is also to draw their attention. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, would use a lot of parables or examples. So he would say, uh, uh, and he would use his hands gesture to illustrate. So he would say, those who remember Allah and those who don't, or the house that people remember Allah in it, and the house does not remember Allah in it, it's like a dead person and a living person. And he would show it and illustrate it through gestures by saying, I was sent and the hour like this. And he would show the resemblance between the index and the middle finger. So this is him and this is a day of judgment. The distance or the timeline is very close to one another. And sometimes he would throw puzzles also to draw people's attention. The Prophet said once, والسلام, there's a tree that its leaves never fall and it's like a Muslim. It resembles a Muslim. Tell me about it. So everybody was giving their guesses about the plants they know. And then the Prophet said, it is the palm tree. And this shows you that the resemblance between a Muslim and a palm tree. And finally, the Prophet ﷺ used a very needed etiquette for us today when talking. He would not publicize people's names in the public. So Aisha says, if the Prophet ﷺ was told something negative about a person, the, the Prophet ﷺ would never go and say publicly, why did so-and-so, and name the person, why did Abdullah do this or say this? Like in the hadith of Ibn al-Lutbiyyah, a man the Prophet dispatched وسلم, to collect the zakat money. So the man came after a few weeks, and said, O Prophet of Allah, this is the zakat money I collected from all the different tribes, and this is a gift that was given to me. So the Prophet ﷺ got onto the pulpit, praised Allah, offered salutation upon the Prophet ﷺ and said, why do we employ people to collect the zakat, and they come back to us saying that this is your zakat and this was given to me. On what basis 
they were given a gift, shouldn't they stay in their father and mother's home and see whether people would give them a gift or not? The answer is definitely not. Because this is a bribe. Had you not been an employee by the government or by the Prophet ﷺ, nobody would have come to your house and said, listen, Akhi, this is a gift for you. But because you're collecting zakat, they're, cut, they're wanting you to cut them some slack. And this is why they're giving you something underneath the table. And this is a bribe. In this hadith, the Prophet did not say, why did Ibn al lutbiyah did so and so and so? He just simply said it vaguely and generally. And this is an etiquette we Muslims need. If you go to YouTube or Instagram or whatever they call them, Snapchats and social media, you will find brothers mentioning by name this da'i, this scholar, this individual, and stripping them, actually, metaphorically, that is. Otherwise, it would have been a rated R. They were stripping them and exposing them and they said this and they said that and they said that and it's back and forth between them it's like volleyball throwing the ball from one court to the other and they're wasting the muslims times and they're slandering one another and they're losing a lot of good deeds and each one of them say i'm doing it for the sake of allah i'm exposing him so that i would warn the muslims and it's all a, a private a vendetta. It's all something inside their hearts filled with malice and envy and may Allah protect us all. Yeah, you want to warn against someone? Don't mention them by name. Just say, generally speaking, don't follow this uh, uh, way of thinking. Follow the mainstream of scholars, trusted scholars, someone who's not controversial, instead of saying Sheikh so-and-so or Dr. so-and-so or Da'i so-and-so, and you fill people's hearts with malice and, and hatred rather than filling it with peace and deen and proper knowledge. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah and welcome back. The first caller is Diane from the UAE. Diane. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamualaikum. Jazakallah khairan shaykh for the lecture. Uh, Alhamdulillah, barakallah feek. So, I actually wanted to ask uh, regarding the uh, reward of praying the, the whole night. If you pray the, the, the Isha prayer with the Tarawi, is it okay if you like miss one or two rakah if the sheikh uh, starts a bit too early? The hadith is crystal clear. Whoever prays with the imam until he's finished, Allah would register to him as if he had prayed the whole night. So if you miss the rakah or more with your imam, unfortunately you don't fall under this hadith. So you will be rewarded, but not as if you have prayed the whole night. So the advice is that you go back home afterwards and you pray as much as you can. And inshallah, Allah will reward you for that. Muhammad from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam So I saw the role model episode you did about what the Prophet Muhammad hated. And one thing you said was that the Prophet ﷺ hated when somebody would mimic or impersonate someone. You said that the Prophet ﷺ told Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her that, and I quote your words, I don't like that I have so-and-so worldly wealth and I would impersonate a person. No, I would never do this, end quote. Where did you get this uh, hadith from, Sheikh? I can't find it anywhere online. Personally, I'm really good at impersonating people and at mimicking accents, but if the Prophet Muhammad Islam hated this, I'll stop doing it, inshallah. Just okay. Wajah Zak, first of all, if I had the ability to quote the references and remember 
where they're at, I wouldn't be sitting here, Rahi. I would be somewhere else in a higher level place. I don't remember these things. I could barely remember what I had for lunch yesterday. Of course, I was fasting. So um, the hadith is authentic without any doubt. And inshallah, 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 any hadith you hear from me is 99.99% authentic. It's like the Arab elections because I entirely rely on authentic hadiths. All of my lectures and try my level best. I don't know the reference at the moment, but an easy search on Islam, qa.info, will get you the answer in a heartbeat. And you will find the hadith with the references, with the page number and the volume. So you have no problem in checking it out. If not, then please come back to me on my website and inshallah uh, I will try my level best to uh, quote it to you though I don't usually even give references on my website but I'm 100% certain that you will find it with the grace of Allah on Islam Q&A.info uh, Brother Zuhaib from Pakistan Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Alaikum Salaam Okay Sheikh my question is regarding the hadith that uh, the woman is uh, married for four reasons, either her beauty, her wealth, her lineage, or her deen. And of course, the best one is who chooses her for her deen. But the other three, uh, preferring a woman from the other three is also allowed. So as far as uh, marrying a woman for wealth is concerned, then what if a person starts depending on his wife's income or wealth? Instead of providing her, he expects her to provide him. What, is that allowed? First of all, the hadith tells us about what is happening, not what is recommended. And this doesn't mean that it is okay. Like when the Prophet tells us about, alayhi salatu salam, the Dajjal, the Antichrist, and what mischief he would do when he comes. It is not a seal of approval, but this is what's going to happen. So usually, in men, individuals, may be attracted to a woman due to her wealth. He's a gold digger. He's looking for a sugar mummy. Or for her beauty, he's a normal uh, uh, man. Or for her lineage, he wants to have power and authority and have pride among the people or for her religious practice, the Prophet recommended to take the woman with the religious practice. Now, if she's from a good family and she's rich and she's beautiful, you've got it made, alhamdulillah. A man who marries a woman for her wealth, he's a gold digger. And this means that he's not a real man. No real man would accept or would expect his wife to chip in the expenses. And I get lots of counseling sessions from the US, Canada, and Europe of women saying that we work a job or two jobs and we support the family. We chip in the expenses. We pay for the rent. And some of them say, my husband doesn't work at all. And I do all the expenses. This is not a real man. This is a wimp. This is someone who biologically can be male but is not a real man. And I'm sorry if you're offended, sue me. A real man does not allow his wife to chip a penny, even if she is a multimillionaire, because he has his pride. He would not dream of a nightmare that one day she would say in a fight to him, didn't I give you? Didn't I pay for you? Didn't I did do this and that for you? This is the worst nightmare a real man could face. But people who are not men, there are so many of them, and they're cheaper by the dozen. Uh, Muhammad from the US. Again. Hi, Muhammad. Um, I think there's a mistake. I don't know why it's, it's not TV. Okay, let me ask you another question. No, no, you don't, you don't have this ability. It should have been Muhammad from India. I don't know where okay. 
Muhammad from okay. India. Well, well, we'll talk to you tomorrow, inshallah, Muhammad. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Alaikum assalam, And you are? Your name? Muhammad from India. Okay, yes, Muhammad. Sheikh, uh, recently me, my mother, and my brother had a conversation. Um, was speaking about my regarding my brother's marriage. Okay. Hello. And during the discussion, an argument broke out, and my mother yelled at me, saying that I should not no more in, be involved in such discussions. So I told back to her, Allahi, insha Allahi, I will not be involved in this discussion again. Now, again, they have apologized back to me and they want me to be involved in, this, in their discussion. Now, is this considered as an oath or how to retract this oath? Yes. Jazakallah This is an oath. If you swore over such a thing, you have to feed or clothe 10 poor Muslims. And if you are unable to do this financially, you have to fast three days. And alhamdulillah, you can get involved with it once again. Uh, Rashad from the Philippines. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, okay, uh, I had discussion with my aunt who is so knowledgeable and uh, she spent all her life reading books, the wrong ones. Anyway, long story short, she believes in Allah, but she loves Sophia. She says there is no hellfire, no Jannah. We will not go back to life after we die. There is no Qiyamah. There is no Shaitan. In Abu Bakr and Umar were criminals. Okay, so what's your question? I decided not to pray Janazah on her and not to make dua for her. If she dies first, inshallah. Am I right? Yes, you're right. She's not a Muslim. Okay, thank you. Shazakallah khair. Barakallah khair. Uh, Aliza from Indonesia. <laughs> Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah grant you good health. I uh, mean, and you my as well. Question is, my question is, is it permissible to say different supplication or zikr in a certain position, in the same or even different raka'ah? For Exa example, on the first sujood, I'd say subhana rabbi al-a'la, but in the second sujood, in the same raka'ah, I'd say subhana rabbi al-a'la wa bihamdi. That's my question. Jazakallahu khair khasiran shaykh. Wa jazakum. First of all, <clears throat> The minimum requirement in sujood is to say Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. After that, the sky is the limit. So if you say once Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la and then say Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la wa bihamdih and say Subbuhun Quddusu Rabbul Malaikati wa Ruh and then say Allahumma laka sajadtu bika amantu alayka tawakkalt sajada wajhi alladhi khalaqahu wa sawarahu etc. No problem. If you say some in the first sajda Others in the second sajda, no problem as long as you say the minimum requirement in each and every sajda, subhana rabbi al-a'la once. Then it's open. You don't have to mimic it throughout the whole prayer. Exactly what I said three times in the first sajda, I have to say three times in the second sajda and the third and the fourth and so on. No. The sky is the limit providing you say the minimum which is subhana rabbi al-a'la once. And I hope this answers your question. Anna from Uganda. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. According to one of the Fatiha hadiths on Nawawiya, it says that we have to leave that which we are doubting in to that which we have no doubt about. Um, and also in the photos of the Muslim Nidwa, for when one is struck by, by his faith, he, is, uh, he or she should say, A'udhu billah, when uh, then desist from doing what he or she is in doubt about. Now, I got from somewhere that if our parents instruct us to do something when we should, then we should do it even if we are in doubt about it. According to the hadith of, a ma of the man who says, praying, uh, uh, who was praying, and his mother called him and he was in doubt whether to respond or not. Now, when he continued with the prayers and didn't respond to his mother, his mother's curse caught him. So according to, uh, according to that, the Sheikh I had said that uh, we, should, we should do that which our parents instruct us to do even if we are in doubt about. So I just want to have more clarity and is it right? No, this is not entirely right, simply because the hadith, da ma yaribuka ila ma la yaribuk, leave what's doubtful to what's not 
doubtful is when you are in doubt. But when you are certain that what your parents are asking you to do is haram, it is totally prohibited for you to obey them. Now, the amount of, if, of doubt is measurable. So if you have 90% doubt that this is not permissible, you have to not obey them until you make sure and certain that this is permissible. But if it is doubtful by 10%, and 90% you have clarity about that, yeah, this is okay. In this case, you have to act upon what they're saying to you because you don't have evidence to back your doubts. It's just mere doubts. So it can be your whims and desires. As for the hadith of Juraj, the priest, when he was praying and his mom called him, he was praying voluntary prayers. So his doubt whether to answer or continue his prayer should not have been there because he should have the knowledge to know that, yes, I must uh, interrupt and break my prayer and to answer my mom. Answering my mom is mandatory. Continuing my voluntary prayer is voluntary. So I should do what is a priority, and that is answering my mother. And I hope this answers your question. Camel from the US. Camel. Okay, Sulaiha from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Can someone keep out of wedlock child named Gabriel or Maryam? I know someone who keep this name to that child. A child that is born out of wedlock, the name has no impact. So because a child was born out of wedlock, oh, we can't call the child Muhammad or we can't call the child Abdullah. There's nothing wrong in that. The crime was in, in conceiving the child in the first place. But after the child is born, oh, can we suckle the child? Can we feed the child? Can we clean the child? It's a normal human being. Of course, you can do all of these things like any other child. He has no fault in the crime of his mother. So calling a baby boy Jibril is permissible because it is permissible to call baby boys by the names of angels. And calling a baby girl Maryam is definitely permissible without any problem in that. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. This is all the time we have for today's episode. Until we meet you same time tomorrow, I leave you fi amanillah. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيراً